I think if I had to begin at the beginning, it would be probably when I was 16 years old. Uh, we had an English teacher who wanted us to do a project on Canadian poets. And so she said, go into the library, uh, use the card catalog. I don't know if you know what a card catalog is, but it was a precursor to an online library catalog, uh, just with little cards in these huge uh, pieces of furniture. She said, use the card catalog to find out where the section is on Canadian poets and find yourself some Canadian poets that you've never heard of before. Just go into the stacks, pull books, start reading, and see if you can find two or three poets that you've never come across before that you'd really like to do a, a little paper on. So I did that. I went to the uh, card catalog, found my way into the library, found myself in the stacks, and I was pulling books by Canadian poets off the shelves. And I came across, well, I came across some poets that I really loved, like Dorothy Livesay and Alden Nolan, but uh, I also came across a Canadian poet that I had never heard of and whose poetry really moved me. I found it really um, beautiful, uh, thought-provoking, and I thought, okay, I'm going to definitely use this person uh, in my project. And I ended up being such a fan that I wrote him a fan letter. Now, this was a long time ago, pre-email. So I actually wrote a letter and I sent it off to his publisher and I knew nothing about the poet other than that he was Canadian and uh, I knew who his publisher was. So I sent off this letter and didn't actually think of think that I would hear anything back. And about three months later, I got an, uh, a package in the mail and it was a book of poetry by this author and he had written me a little note back thanking me. And he had also, also inscribed the book. He had said to Nancy with thanks for her kind remarks about my poetry. So I was thrilled, of course, right? Because I had written a fan letter and the person to whom I'd written had actually written back. And the person ended up being F.R. Scott, uh, who's a very renowned uh, Canadian poet. But what I didn't know was that uh, he's also known by Frank Scott and he was one of the preeminent uh, constitutional uh, professors, lawyers, thinkers uh, in Canada, working at McGill as a professor. Um, and he still is one of the major figures in constitutional law um, in Canada. I mean, he's dead now, but his work still lives on and is often cited. And so for me, what I discovered at the age of 16 was three threads coming together, uh, which was uh, English literature, uh, library work, and law. And I think those three threads have continued to inform my work right up until today. So I went on to uh, do an undergrad and graduate work in English literature. I then went to library school and did a degree in library school. And then finally found my way to law school and did uh, you know, a JD and graduate work in law school as well. So as I say, those three threads continue to inform what I do today and the type of research that I do. So it's a long way back, but that's where it all began. I think it, one of the things I really enjoy discussing in class is uh, the presumptions that the court courts bring to the uh, task of statutory interpretation. So I do a lot uh, with statutes in my class, and one of the things is uh, how do courts interpret statutes? Now, this is a whole field of study on its own, but what's interesting about it is the courts have come up with a number of rules, some of which go right back to cases in the 1500s. And obviously it's too much to discuss in detail here, but there are several presumptions that the courts begin with when they come to a, a statute that they don't, uh, that they're having difficulty interpreting. So for example, the presumption that I really enjoy is uh, that Parliament was presumed to know everything it had to know in order to produce a piece of legislation. And that's a tall order, I think. I mean, imagine if someone ap approaches your work and says, uh, well, I'm just presuming you knew everything you needed to know in order to produce this. And so what that means is that when Parliament writes, when Parliament uh, drafts and passes any type of statute, 
uh, Parliament is presumed to know everything there is to know about science, about technology, about economics, about uh, business, about commerce, uh, about the social situation, and key to that, uh, all, all existing case law. Uh, so you can see the reason behind that. No one wants, uh, no one wants the courts to come to uh, a statute uh, whose uh, um, meaning is in dispute. And, and you don't want a judge to say, I don't think Parliament, uh, or I don't think the individuals drafting this knew uh, enough about science. So I think we need to read that into, into the statute. So you can see why that presumption is important. And it takes a lot to displace that presumption. Uh, so if, uh, if one, uh, one side of a particular dispute is arguing that uh, sh Parliament would not have drafted a section this way had it known about this case, or had it known about um, you know, something else, uh, that's not really going to fly. The, the courts are going to say, um, no, we're not, we're not going to start with that presumption. We'll start thinking that we'll start, uh, we'll start um, with the presumption that they knew what they had to know. And that also involves language, actually. So language is key on this because uh, there's another presumption. And as I said, there's a number of presumptions. Uh, but another presumption that I enjoy discussing in class is that um, it's the presumption against surplusage, which means that Parliament doesn't use extra or excess words. So let's say, for example, you have a statute. And uh, in that statute, you have a section that says, authorization is required to do X. And then two sections later, it says, authorization is ordinarily required to do X. So you might be a lawyer on one side making the case that, well, it required and ordinarily required are obviously the same thing. But the courts would begin with the presumption against surplusage. In other words, that every word that's used is meaningful. And so as a result, they would say, required and ordinarily required are not the same thing. We can't treat them as the same thing. And again, as I say, it's such a tall order. Again, for if you just think about individuals like you and I, that every word you use is meaningful. Uh, it's, it's really quite, uh, it's quite an interesting thing. And, but these are the presumptions that courts begin with. And so it's interesting how these cases are decided when you have a number of rules that the courts start with when they're trying to interpret statutes. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm working on a dictionary. It's published by Carswell. It's called the Dictionary of Canadian Law. Uh, it's, I'm working on the fifth edition, so there have been four editions before this. It's probably the best known uh, dictionary in Canadian law. It's been cited something like 900 times by the courts, uh, in courts and tribunals in Canada. Uh, it's 1,400 pages and 31,000 entries approximately. So it's a gigantic project that is going to take me several years, but I've already started in on it. And uh, the thing that I discovered about working on a dictionary, I wasn't sure I was going to like it to begin with, but I've discovered I really love it because uh, every word takes you to a different place. So for example, um, I've consulted modern Canadian case law, ancient Canadian case law, modern uh, US and UK case law, ancient cases from those two countries as well. Uh, I've looked at uh, current treatises, very old uh, law books, uh, some from the 1700s. Uh, I've looked at cases actually right back to the 1500s uh, for various, just trying to come up with a satisfactory definition for a lot of words. But it's not just legal books that I'm consulting. I have to look at business. Uh, I've looked at a lot of business books, uh, looked at... Um, things on economics, sociology, medicine, uh, um, science, uh, and on and on. Just trying to come up, first of all, just trying to, sometimes I don't know the definition of the word, but I'm not, but I do know that the definition that's there is not helping me. And so what I'm doing is I'm going right back to scratch and trying to put myself in the mind of a first or second year law student and saying, would this definition help me? And if it wouldn't, then I'm starting all over, which is why I'm consulting so many sources. So it's not just a matter of 
going through the words and saying, yeah, 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 th these are all fine. I just have to you know, clean up a few words here and there. It's really starting from scratch because there's a new mind there. And uh, the first edition was done by a group of people. Uh, the second through fourth edition was done by uh, a lawyer named Daphne Duclos. And she, uh, she sometimes had an assistant and sometimes not. And I think what I'm seeing in the dictionary is the product of a lot of people. And what I want to do is make it really much more uniform, uh, make it so that uh, it's cited many more times uh, by courts because it's just more usable. I don't think that in Canada, our number one dictionary should be Blacks. It shouldn't be a US dictionary. It really should be a Canadian dictionary. And I'm hoping to make this dictionary the dictionary, the Canadian dictionary that we use. So I'm really enjoying the places that I'm that uh, these words are dragging me into and then out popping out of again. Sometimes you fall down a rabbit hole with a particular word. Um, asset, for example, I was just spent two days on the word asset or terms with the word asset in it, like uh, um, uh, business asset, common asset, contingent asset, liquid asset, surplus asset, uh, fishing asset, farming asset, matrimonial asset. As I said, you fall you fall down a, a rabbit hole, and then by the time you reach the end of those terms, you pop back up, and it's on to the next word, whatever comes after asset. So that's that's really what I'm doing, and it's probably going to take, as I said, several years. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to working on it, and also looking forward to seeing the final product whenever that happens. I'm hoping that the books that I've written, I've written several books on legal research, and I'm hoping that the books that I've written help people who otherwise would be terribly stressed by legal research. Uh, legal research is actually, I think, something that doesn't have to cause a great deal of stress if you know where to start, uh, what sources to check, and when you're done. A lot of people don't know when they're done because they feel like they're reinventing the wheel or going around in circles. Um, and, and often it's really, a, it's, it's a quite diagnosable problem, whatever problem they're having. So I'm hoping that uh, both teaching and writing uh, in the field that I write in and teach in has helped people who are trying to do legal research and I mean primarily given them some confidence that once they've gone through all the steps, there's really no other place to look. They've beaten all the bushes. The answer they have is the best answer they can possibly come up with. And, um, and I'm hoping I save them time as well.